are you? Uh, my name is Jeanette Bauer. I am managing director for Red Theater for this particular production. I am producer, production manager, and lighting designer. Is that all? Uh, I think so. Yeah, probably there's more. <laughs> uh, my name is Aaron Sawyer. I'm the artistic director of Red Theater Chicago, and I was the director of this show. My name is Beth Harris, and I play the nurse. My name is Simone Chabot, and I'm currently involved in R&J The Vineyard, uh, Red Theater and Oracle's co-production of Romeo and Juliet. Um, imagine a real life Martha Vineyard Island where people are socializing with deaf and hearing people almost 300 years. Many times, can people would sign if a deaf person is not there. And that hearing person already is aware of that deaf culture and it becomes a part of their everyday life. That's how we show what we do here. It was just a small example of something that happened a long time ago. Uh, I took two years in high school um, and then didn't use for six years. Um, so I know a little, but using it is hard. I also have just been studying for about two years and learning a lot as fast as I can in this project. I didn't grow up with any deaf family or really a connection to the deaf community uh, in my younger years, but in high school I decided to uh, take some ASL classes and uh, thankfully they were very strong ASL and not signed English based classes and from there I was immediately hooked and wanted to be an interpreter from then on. Uh, once I started to learn the language I kept making connections with my theatrical foundation. Oh, acting is like this grammatical concept in ASL and it's three-dimensional space and so you're putting language in front of you instead of through your vocal instrument. So that was always really what in initially intrigued me about the language, but then once I started to immerse myself in the deaf community and understand deaf culture and deaf history here in America, which includes Martha's Vineyard and the bilingual, bicultural community that developed there on the island, that's really uh, when I decided to continue and make the deaf community and serving the deaf community part of my life. You really get to understand that two people can really be across the room and communicate and there is no other language that you can do that in. You can yell across the room but you can't guarantee that that person is getting every word you say. Whereas ASL you're just signing and you know that they get it. Without the huge generosity of Rob Rousseau, we could not have done in rehearsals because you've got to have an interpreter for anybody who isn't ASL capable. And I would qualify for that, especially at this level. Um, and so if you don't have interpreters regularly, you know, get $60, $65 an hour, um, and, and that's honored and deserved and kills a theater company because we have hundreds of hours of rehearsal and that's our whole budget right there. And, and so it's really just about grants and money and making this happen until, I guess, an ideal day where there's a company that can exist that can just all talk and speak together, like this Martha's Vineyard Island in the play. Uh, in Chicago, there hasn't been a lot of deaf-centric theater lately, unfortunately, and within the past ten years, really. So when this show was being developed, I was immediately fascinated and wanted to be a part of it as much as I could. We could not find uh, an actress under 30 who was non-equity in Chicago who was available to do this show, to play Juliet. We love our Juliet, but there was zero deaf actresses available to do that. Some of it was a little bit economic reasons and, and others just, there's just not enough. There's not there. We're not growing them. Um, it doesn't exist. That's wrong. And I think that shows like this will inspire uh, a new generation uh, of deaf artists and actors.
probably just a week before we opened, I was speaking really, really well because the development of Juliet growing up, we had chosen, you had chosen that she grew up in the Capulet family. She would have never learned to sign. She would have been forced to speak her whole life. And at one point I was so frustrated because I was doing all this signing the entire show, speaking, you know, five, six lines or so. And then when I did speak, it was so good. I learned this level of sign, and yet I learned this level of speech, and I was like, nope, we have to go back. We have to go back to that deaf accent and that scary place that's kind of dangerous to put on stage. You take the original Shakespearean English, first folio or the adaptation you're using, and then you translate that into modern English, and then you translate that into American Sign Language, and then you take the nuances and the metaphor and the similes and the iambic pentameter that Shakespeare uses, and you filter that and adapt those nuances into the ASL translation. So it's all of these things working together, and it turns into something that is incredibly dynamic. It's a challenge because with the translation of the lines, uh, I, I'm not really very fluent in Shakespeare myself. So working on the language and the conversation was very, it was a big challenge. And I was very impressed by what you all brought to the table. And I was able to get involved with the signs and understandings that way. I'm very proud of everyone because it's very hard. It's, a, it's, a very, and it's not an easy process. And learning how to sign the lines and learning how to get involved in it and, and bring life to it, I think that itself, being Romeo, was a very fascinating challenge for me. And it's very in-depth thought processes. And I was able to dive into that right away because we worked and we worked and we worked and we worked. And it all kind of worked out in a way that I could connect to it, I could find a, a connection with it. I have an ASL script in my head and I have an English script in my head and they are on a trajectory that is simultaneous. And that's how I memorize my lines. Usually when you see sign language with theater, it's, it's a translation or it's an interpretation and this is a show about communication and you have deaf actors and you have deaf characters, you have hearing actors and hearing characters, and hard of hearing actors and hard of hearing characters, and it's, it's about that, it's much more real, it's not the interpretation of the story, it's much more in the moment, and I don't think we see that enough in theater, and I think it's something that we all want to see more of. Chicago doesn't have that, Chicago's such a huge theater town. The best that we've got right now otherwise is a play for hearing people, and then over here, either words or someone signing but they're not the same thing at all. And the real pride we have is that it's all together. Um, and the funny thing is also we had a deaf audience member come and they said, where's the interpreter? And we said, there's no interpreter. And he said, oh, and he started to leave very upset. And we were like, whoa, 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 whoa. You don't need an interpreter for this show. Um, and that's, that's been a real point of pride. behind us, John Wilson did the scenic, um, Amber Freer, Kessler, Kessler, Kessler Freer, uh, did the costumes, Scott Dickens did the props, and um, they really took their pieces and made it their own. I mean, um, John Wilson took a meeting with Aaron, and then three days later, he pretty much had this in his head ready to go, um, and he really took from the agricultural side versus the Capulets and being very tourism with a lot of money and blended that all together as well as bringing in the ocean because we are on an island um, and really brought that in with the blues and everything on the bottom of the set that you might not notice at first glance. A lot of the sound also had light cues associated with it because some of the sound was meant to make you either uncomfortable or aware and at the same time, we would change the lighting so that the other half of, of our audience, our deaf audience, would also be aware that there was a tonal change happening. And 
we wanted to be very sensitive with that to make sure that both sides had these different kind of cues that were affecting the performance. Um, and then on the costume side, we always wanted to stay a little bit in period, but realized that that's also not necessarily easy to do. And um, yeah, Shakespeare didn't care about that in his day. We know. Yeah. Right. And so. We try to stay within the time period, but still give ourselves a little bit of freedom to go outside of that and build up on these characters without making them clown-like. Yeah. And with the sound designer, I think we also just worked and went down the rabbit hole towards what what kind of sounds create the same sensations as having hearing loss, with, or some of the higher pitches, and just really stretching the the, the human ear. Uh, and making you aware of sound like you're not normally. I had a dream last night. Oh, uh, did, and so did I. One thing that's dumping is, a, is also a way of getting somebody's attention, which is the same as tapping them on the shoulder. So the mm -hmm. idea of stomping or that tapping. <laughs> It's very similar to like screaming. <laughs> bravo and bravo to all of you. Oh. The best thing in the world would be if people see this, they realize that something like this hasn't happened for 15 years in Chicago, and they say, we can't go another 15 years. Um, we need another one, if not next year, the year after that. We've, we've been working on this for two and a half years, I mean, the idea came out of my head in, in to Aaron's ears May of 2013. That's how long we've been working on this. And so to know that it's actually happening is still a little surreal. I still come to the theater every night and I'm like, this is really happening. This is actually going on stage and people are seeing it. Um, but that's the whole point. People have to come out and see it and we want everyone that can possibly come out to see it, come and see it.